right, so let's talk about the control of the threshold voltage a little bit more. So we just talked about short channel effects and showed that there can be a, a, a threshold voltage roll off that would be bad and decrease device performance. So let's see how much uh, control you can get. All right, you had just seen the sketch uh, of how this triangle here can um, modify the effective channel length, so to speak, that you have good control over because you have a competition between the, uh, the source uh, uh, depletion region and the source charges in the PN junction on the source uh, gate side. And if you include two gates, you sort of add up the electrostatic field lines and you have better control. So you effectively have impinging um, electric fields from both sides of the channel and that gives you better control of the channel. So that's called, this technology here is called silicon on insulator. So you have a very thin channel slab of silicon that actually sits and has been grown over silicon dioxide and you have a gate underneath and you have silicon dioxide on the top or some oxide and then uh, the gate voltage. So you have two gates that are hooked up together electrically and they can control uh, the channel better. So as depicted here, you effectively are adding these electric fields from the top and the bottom and your overall channel now is under better electrostatic control. Okay. Now, the three-dimensional ultimate example of that is rather than just having a slab of electrons, this is the FinFET. Okay. The FinFET is pretty tall. Uh, it's in, as you've seen, I had shown you in the earlier slides a sketch of this. So it's taller than in the sketch, but it means you have electrostatic control all the way around this channel. I mean, not quite all the way around, right? It's, it's a wraparound, sometimes called an omega FET or X FET, uh, but basically the gate wraps around, and you can think of it just like squeezing a garden hose, if you will. And, but you squeeze it from, from three sides, okay? So there you have better electrostatic control. Here's an animation I made with a nanowire tool on NanoHub. You can do this with a quantum simulation in a tool called OmenWire, where you can see uh, here's a plot on the bottom right that's the electrostatic potential for different modes that are existing in the wire. Remember, we have uh, a quantum state, we might have ground state and excited states. And if you ever calculated an electromagnetics uh, TE modes into a uh, in a, um, a waveguide. This is similar. You have quantized modes for electron conduction and there's, in this example, there's uh, these three modes and the electrostatics control all three modes. And uh, up here you have a 1D plot of the electro uh, electron density in the channel. So um, it goes from uh, the no intentional doping here in a step function and you can see how electrons have diffused into the channel here and you can see how the gate is increasing and decreasing the electron density in the system. Now in the middle you have the sort of cool looking three-dimensional rendering of the electron density as electrons can penetrate into the channel okay as a function of gate voltage. Now what this shows is that you have indeed these these modes of charge that are similar to this here on the right. So there's multiple modes in the system and the overall charge is being controlled here by the central gate region, okay? But the, in this simulation here, you have a gate all around gate GAA nanowire, okay? So, but that gives you an idea of a three-dimensional representation of charge flow in these nanowires. Now, if you have such nanowires in a, or, or FinFET type structures, you actually, in, in a sort of simple point of view of representing effects uh, that will occur, are is that, so you have these uh, quantum dots or, or quantized states in the system, right? We have calculated the eigenstates of a particle in a box. 
you can write this down. Looks like um, h bar, yeah, it's the usual h bar square k square over 2m star. And uh, your k is now some, uh, some, some multiple n pi over uh, l, right? So you can fit in half wavelengths. So this is roughly, and here's the the uh, oxide thickness, right? TSI. So you've done this. This is very simple stuff. So, but now you can sketch in your eigenenergies for the electrons, and you know the holes have a, typically a heavier mass, and uh, so the state separation is different. Now, these eigenenergies depend as a uh, on the uh, uh, function of thickness. So if you have fluctuations in the thickness, these eigenstates will go up and down along the channel or from device to device. So you will have fluctuations and your overall gap is also changed, okay? You're not just going from the conduction to the valence band, you're actually going from the uppermost confined hole state to the lowest uh, electron state. And you can only fit so many electrons in there, so to speak, then these other states play a role depending on their energy how far, away, how far away they are. All right, so you have effectively a new gap that you need to deal with. Now, um, so those are variations that you can have in the, in the device, and you can have um, significant reduction uh, in other effects as well. So as you now make the, um, the nanowire diameter smaller and smaller, what has been shown that it's pretty old now, this is from a uh, Samsung group in 2007. What they did is they reduced the nanometer, uh, the nanowire diameter quite a bit. And what they find is that the current goes up, um, that they can push through the system like this for a P-doped and N-doped device, but as they get smaller, then the current drops off precipitously, and if they uh, plot this as a function of mobility, they see that there's a dramatic mobility drop as you get to three nanometers. Okay, so what causes this? So we've worked on this quite a while ago now, and we associate this inter due to interface roughness scattering. And here's an atomistic representation of such a device, where we had a full band a tight binding atomistic simulation in 3D. We included the silicon dioxide in the simulation and um, uh, compared uh, our simulation results with experiment, okay? And uh, we had to run many simulations, right? Because this is like taking statistical uh, samples. Each device looks slightly different. And so you take multiple samples uh, so the computational cost can be pretty high. Uh, the electrons can penetrate into this uh, oxide region, so they can tunnel in there. So we accounted for that by, by including that in the transport domain. And um, as we make this uh, a non-ideal wire, the computational cost increases a little bit. Okay, Actually, it increases quite a bit, because for us, the number of atoms in the cross-section is critical. So. We're doing this with an atomistic representation. We have proper band structure in the system. I don't have time to talk about this in this class. And uh, the key element here is that the effective mass approximation can't get you quite to the results that you need um, to explain this experiment. So um, if you have a, a perfect wire, you would have a very smooth uh, transmission times Fermi function. So you you inject your carriers over a, a, a reasonable energy range and things look smooth. But if your system is rough, then you actually have not just a smooth um, potential profile along the channel, but your density of states along the channel is really modified quite a bit and you have a lot of backscattering and that is what ultimately reduces the, the mobility in the system. So it's really the roughness is becoming more and more important. The interface becomes more and more important as you reduce the diameter of the wire. 
There's another aspect, aspect I'd like to highlight, which is the variability uh, due to uh, low doping. or um, What you really have in these devices, so this is actually a, still a relatively large device, you have discrete dopants in the channel. And there's fluctuations with these uh, discrete dopants. And people have worried about this and, and, and worked on these effects and have calculated a, um, a, the fluctuation due to these dopants uh, not being exact. And these dopants are discrete, right? They're, they're invaders, so to speak, that are placed there for purpose but they're not well ordered. And there's even people talking about ordering these uh, dopants. And I've been involved in doing this for quantum computing where we can place a single dopant or a, a chain of dopants very well in, an, in a research lab. But that's a whole other story. So in a real device, you still will either um, implant or diffuse in these dopants at a random way, okay? But these random dopants actually play a role, and even individual dopants can play a role as well. And you can measure the tunneling through individual dopants. And um, so you, people have looked at the variability in the threshold voltage for, for individual devices, but now imagine you need to do all this uh, in a huge wafer, a 12-inch wafer with a, um, for each um, die in there has maybe 10 billion transistors on it. That is just an incredibly uh, hard process uh, technology. And you have to make sure that the transistors are mostly all the same. If they're all different, then your circuit really has a, a pretty significant problem because it really depends. The, the drain voltage you can push through the system depends as a square of the threshold voltage. Okay, So you have to control the threshold voltage well. And one way to do that is to control it with a backgate, okay, or a substrate bias, where you can tr uh, control the, uh, the depletion regions in your region, and you can control the quasi-Fermi level in, for, the, uh, for the electrons in this, in this case here, in deep in the, in the substrate. Now, this works for this 2D uh, uh, larger device, in a nanowire, you don't really have a substrate bias like this, or it has little influence, but this is one way to control the, uh, the threshold. You can also control uh, the threshold by the uh, metal work function. We talked about that, right? Um, earlier, to, you can shift the threshold voltage. And um, here we go. That's the same sketch as what we had before by choosing your threshold, uh, your uh, metal work function, you can shift um, your circuit up to, say, higher uh, threshold voltages to compensate um, uh, effects due to uh, smaller oxides, etc. right? So um, you can play with this um, work function over here in order to control the threshold voltage a bit more, okay? Good. We've seen all these expressions. Now, I've shown these slides at the end when we calculated the MOS capacitor in more detail. We had derived, say, a numerical-like approach in which you can calculate these things exactly. But remember, if you're making this system really small, you don't just have a, a, a classical distribution of charge. You actually need to treat this like a triangular quantum well, where you have discrete states, and you need to deal with a wave function, and effectively you, you have a new band gap, right? Because you raised the state up from the triangular notch, and you shift away the charge from the interface since the wave function is going to roughly to zero here at the edge. So a classical solution would pile up the charge against the interface, a quantum solution will push it away from the interface. All right, now I'd highlighted this before. It was a big challenge to do this quantum type simulation and to do it fast. And if you have a, the traditional approach where we don't know how to deal with open boundary conditions, where you just say, I'm making this a big part of the 
or I make this a closed box and I calculate the eigenstate in this system and I, I kind of just worry about these states, well, you won't get the right result because you really don't calculate these states up here that are continuum broadened states. So we had developed a methodology for that in this NEMO software early on, 97 or something, yeah, 97, where we can consider these quasi-continuum states that are here and we include the discrete states and we can tunnel out of the discrete states and we can tunnel out of the quasi-continuum states and have the right tunneling current. So that was a way to manage the tunneling current and the really cool thing was as people uh, measured these um, very thin oxides, they saw that, um, that's in this slide, that these curves were not taking, they had like a little kink in the curve. It's harder to see here, right? But you see that there is this inflection point here and here. And that is really due to tunneling out of electron states and tunneling out of hole states to the other side. That's really when, this, when you're going across a band gap. And this tool set was the first one to really uh, understand that and model this right and do this with continuum states. So we have evolved quite a ways from the pure classical uh, particle simulations. And then uh, as we do that, uh, we can actually calibrate the capacitance in the system really well and overlap experiment and theory. And this software was then built for uh, by Chris Bowen to really calibrate the, the processes by at Texas Instruments through quantum simulation to, to gauge the thickness of the oxides. All right. So don't make the oxides too thin. You have the tunneling expressions. Here's another set of data um, where this has been performed and experimentally validated. Okay. And last one is here, how to make the VT, uh, v, v threshold roll off small is to uh, mess around here with the uh, dielectric constant in the oxide. If you can uh, make a high K dielectric, you can reduce um, this L min quite a bit and, and therefore uh, reduce the, um, the effects on the threshold fluctuation, right? Fle so we, we had plotted here as a function of gate length L, we said the delta uh, or the th V threshold is going down, okay? And you can uh, reduce this effect by increasing the oxide. We had discussed that in the previous section, but the downside is that these dielectrics also have uh, uh, charge traps in them, which have their own issues again. All right. So if you can uh, incre increase the oxide uh, kappa, you can, uh, you can increase the capacitance, you can increase the drain current. We have discussed that as well. So the capability of the channel is getting bigger and you can operate it. Uh, uh, you, you don't need to apply such a, a larger gate voltage if you can reduce this threshold voltage like this, okay? So, so thicker oxides for the same capacitance ensures the drive current is not reduced, but the tunneling current is suppressed. All right, so that wraps it up on the control of the threshold voltage. And in the last segment, I want to talk about mobility enhancements, and I'll see you there. So thank you. <laughs>